My name is Liam and I hate movies. And last year, a lot of movies came out, most of which were utter garbage, but there were ten that were less garbage than the others. These are those ten. This is Feedback Real- I'm here with my very best friend in the whole wide world whose surname starts with K, Kirky! Say uh, something interesting. Um, dogs are faster than cats, objectively. All right, let's, let's just jump right into it, eh? Yes, yes, let's do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, number ten. Three, two, one. Borat subsequent movie film delivery of prodigious bribe to American regime for make benefit once glorious nation of Kazakhstan. So Mangrove is part of the, um, the Steve McQueen kind of series where he made, I think it's five different films and it's all about um, prejudice and racism. Each different story is, it focuses on a different topic in that. And Mangrove was the best courtroom drama of the year. It's very uncomfortable, but it's a topical kind of story and it's set in the 50s or, or 60s, I can't remember. But it's still incredibly relevant to today and that's what's great about it and scary. Um, plus it's just got strong performances and you know, Steve McQueen, love you Steve. I watched or The Great Escape this year, it was good. Steve McQueen and Steve McQueen aren't the same. They're not. They're different. I thought he like grew <laughs> up and started directing. <laughs> One of them is Black Hartley. No, I didn't know. I didn't know. Steve McQueen is dead. I think I knew there was a black Steve McQueen. I just forgot briefly. <laughs> Borat was also very good. Shockingly enough, there was a comedy sequel that came out 14 years after the original that was actually funny. Hank Mantu. There was another one that came out this year as well, but it's not on my list, so we're not going to talk about it. Anyway, Borat's subsequent movie film came about as a genuine shock because Sacha Baron Cohen had said quite a while ago that the character was completely retired. And, um... He is re <laughs> <laughs> I'm quoting the movie! I'm quoting the first movie! You can't cancel me! The movie focuses a lot more on social satire than the original, but it's still very funny and I got a, lot, mm. got a lot out of it. Not that there wasn't social satire present in the first movie, and if you watch this movie and your response was, oh, why did Borat get political? You're a moron. You never deserved Borat in the first place, frankly, if you mm. didn't recognize the satire. But this is, this is very topical. It was a lot more broad in the first one, and it, it sort of almost unintentionally serves as a time capsule of 2020, because they made this movie and they started before COVID, and then, well, then it happened, and the movie was written around it. It does show, but it doesn't, because the ending is so unbelievably perfect, and they clearly didn't have a plan because it relies entirely on the existence of COVID. So, good job, Sasha Baron Cohen and the 20 writers that were credited on this movie. And very good job to Maria Bakalova, because she was a revelation. I, she held her own against Sasha Baron Cohen, which didn't think was possible, but, there you go. Complete unknown actress. Lovely. Would you say it's a great success? Yeah, yes. I would call Borat's subsequent movie film a great success. Ah. If you're having girl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I okay. got nine. Two. One. No Never matter Never rarely, sometimes always. Alright, another movie I haven't seen. <laughs> what more <laughs> need be say? To a it's, movie about Nomad. Nomadland was a was a very good movie, um, focused on a group of people that I frankly didn't really know existed, so it was very eye-opening, and works as a sort of pseudo-documentary because a lot of the supporting cast play themselves, but Frances McDormand really anchors the movie as the character she plays. It's a character that lives a very contradictory lifestyle, but it's very frustrating to watch, but it's all too real and it, it's hard to walk that line between an unlikable character and a character that's just what a lot of people are really like. And it's very sad, but very heartwarming in a way as well, because as I say, a lot of these people play themselves and they live an alternative lifestyle that they're very happy with. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, no, I just agree with you. So what about Never Rarely, Sometimes Always? It's a kick in the dick, is what it is. Yeah, so this movie is one of the most heartbreaking movies I think I've seen in a long time. It's a little bit too real, a little bit too grounded. But I, I, I'm saying that as if it's a negative thing. It's not. It is very, very good. And it's got stunning performances. Um, I think her name is Sydney Flanagan. Quite frankly, amazing. It's a very simple kind of story, but it's told in an effective way. And the subject itself is not simple at all. And it's it just works on every front. Really liked it, and I'll never watch it again. But yeah, it was great. I 
Shiva Baby. I did too. And have you seen Deer Skin? I have not. <laughs> That's three for three, baby. Three for three. Oh. Yeah, Deer Skin. Finally, a movie that's uh, stupid, but in a good way, as opposed to Borat, which was just stupid. Um, so, Deer Skin is one of the best dark comedies of 2020. The best thing about it is how ridiculous it is, but how well it plays itself into reality because it's about a guy that gets a deerskin coat, then the deerskin coat starts telling him to kill people <laughs> and get more deerskin items. Oh, I'm, really, I'm really annoyed I am. <laughs> it's so good. It's got a lot of gore, a lot of violence, um, but it's very, very funny and incredibly entertaining. Couldn't recommend it more. Shiver Baby is a, it's a very, very relatable movie. It captures that sort of awkwardness that we can all relate to of family gatherings and also the awkwardness of being a, a Jewish sugar baby, which um, I'm sure that I'm sure that if I was a Jewish sugar baby, I'd relate really hard. It's a very tense movie. Yeah, it's it's a real trip and not a good one, because <laughs> it uses music and uh, zooms and color grading to really just place you in the world of this character, who you don't exactly like very much. She's not a very likable character, no. but she's very easy to get in the head of. Very few people, I imagine, have been in this particular circumstance. Yeah. Nonetheless, it's just a family gathering, and those always kind of suck. No offense, my family. I just mean they're very awkward, and this one gets more awkward than the average one. Big shout out to Fred Melamed, who plays the dad in the, in the movie, because I see him in a lot of things, and I always forget his name, but every time I see him, I'm like, I know that guy. He's good. He plays that dad character mm -hmm. to perfection. Very uh, cheaply made movie, and the uh, director, whose name I've forgotten, I'm going to put the name up. Hello. She's um, going places. For yeah, it's a link, man. Yes, great. So Ligman. Ella Seligman made, <laughs> made a very great movie. Great movie, but fucking hell. She made a, a great short film that I watched. Oh, fuck's sake. Sorry. I just like that you, you gave up. Emma Seligman made a great short film that I remember watching before watching the full, yes. full feature, and it got a lot of traction, got funding on that basis, and the feature is, is just as good if not better, because it's a feature. And it manages to expand on all of the ideas that are set up in the short film. Short film's basically just the first act of the film. It's it's great, I loved it. Seven, 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 two, two one. Nomadland. There we go. We'll go through Nomadland quickly because I don't have a whole lot to add to what you said. One of my notes was Frances McDormand could kill me and I would thank her. Um, so if you're out there and watching this, Sam loved the message that it had about like moving on. Yeah. Um, it's a very strong film. And Chloe Zhao is one of the best upcoming filmmakers. I guess she's not upcoming, she won an Oscar. You know? Yeah, and, um, uh, and we know where she's headed. Mm, if you haven't seen it, then watch it. Okay. Palm Springs is great too. Palm Springs, yes, the Groundhog Day movie. It's a time loop movie which is unfortunately a trope that was done so well in its first iteration that now every movie after it is now referred to as the Groundhog Day movie. Mm -hmm. Because it definitely does draw inspiration from Groundhog Day, even beyond the time loop thing. It's very existential and nihilistic, but it, it adds a different twist to it in that there's multiple characters stuck in the time loop and you get a lot of different conflicting philosophies in the sense because Andy Samberg's character, Niles, has been trapped in the time loop for, I heard the director say it was at least 40 years which, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So he's given up, he's, he's very nihilistic, while Kristen Milioti's character, Sarah, is still quite optimistic about the whole thing. And then there's J.K. Simmons, who's just, who just goes insane, which yeah. is very fair enough, and it's implied that Andy Samberg went insane as well. We know at this point that Andy Samberg can act, but it's nice to have it reaffirmed every now and again. And Kristen Milioti was done so dirty by the How I Met Your Mother finale that now I, I stand up and cheer every time I see her do something good. She's um, fantastic. She could also kill me. J.K. Simmons can kill me as well. Not in a sexual way, just to know. No, in a slightly sexual way. I'm going to just segue into sort of spoilers right now because there's something I really want to talk about. My favorite bits of this movie were like the little tidbits that implied the possibility of like a, a, a larger sort of thing at play. Like the old woman. Mm -hmm. The old woman who's definitely in the time loop as well. Yeah. Why is she there? Is she there because she thinks she's she's, she's about to die? So she's just staying, staying that way? Like that's, that's a 
incredibly cool concept. Yeah. Someone who just repeats the same day, that, yeah. repeats the same day over and over again, just just to stave off death. And also, when J.K. Simmons sees Niles at the end, and Niles is like, hey, hey, "Whatever, man, I, I, who are you?" Like, does that mean that like that you just keep going into an alternate timeline every time that you? Your loop. And does that mean that this Niles is also going to get trapped in the loop because he has no influencing factor to stop him getting trapped into the loop? Because it, it, he's just the original Niles, sort of, kind of. Time travel. Not time travel. Not time travel. It is time travel. Comment below if it's time travel. It's also just a very comfy movie, which does contrast with the fact that it's existentially horrifying. Mm -hmm. It walks that line very well. We get to four, five, six. One, two. Oh, no, it's countdown. Three, two, one. The Sound father. of metal. The father is one of the most terrifying, uh, beautiful movies you'll ever watch. One of the things I loved about it is that it didn't feel like a play, which, you know, it's based off that source material. But there are a lot of movies uh, that come from plays that feel like they would be better on a stage. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is one of those, which Basically, also, also yeah, came out last year. Nearly every Aaron Sorkin movie. <laughs> Even the ones that weren't based on plays. Trial of Chicago 7! Anyway, go on. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> There's a lot to say about, you know, the cast. Anthony Hopkins, his best performance, oh, really. Yeah. And he's now the oldest person to win Best Actor in a leading role. But that being said, the whole ensemble is just brilliant. I, I loved seeing some faces that I haven't really seen before as well. And they were really holding their own against, you know, giants like Olivia Coleman and Anthony Hopkins. It was great. Well, it was nice to see Mark Gattis, the man he's referred to. Ah, yep, 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 yep. Yeah, it was nice to see him doing something good, knowing where he sort of got his start. Yeah. I don't know if that was where he started, but that's where I first saw him, was Sherlock. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but the best thing about The Father is that, like, it, it kind of just reminds you about how, you know, beautiful life can be and how much you, you, you gotta hold on to what's important because maybe one day you won't have that, you know? Um, yeah, very important film, uh, very beautiful film, scary, but must watch. Uh, the way it's told is incredible. A Sound of Metal, if you don't know, follows a drummer in a metal band that loses his hearing. And it really doesn't suck around with that premise. It jumps right in, he's losing his hearing pretty much immediately. Mm -hmm. And it's powerful and intense. The sound design helps a lot, obviously. Yes. Riz Ahmed, who plays Ruben, the main character, he's incredible. It's such a, it's such a strong character study into someone who basically goes through, from his perspective, the worst possible thing he could go through and he makes some bad decisions as the movie goes on, but... It's very real decisions as well, because, you know, if you're in that situation, you probably think that going that, about it a option. certain way yeah. is, is the only way to do it, you know? Absolutely, and you, you can't help but feel really sorry for it. Very strong performances all around, the supporting cast such as his girlfriend, and the people at the hearing rehabilitation place, the, the um, actor who plays that character who I believe is deaf in real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The person who runs it. He's incredibly good. I enjoyed the whole thing. I mean, it's hard to enjoy, but I... Both of the movies in this slot aren't really yeah. that enjoyable. Oh, with The Father, I didn't enjoy it. Yeah, okay. I loved it, but I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. Sound of Metal has has a few hills and valleys, and parts of it are, are quite are quite fun in, in a way. Yeah. Um, or, or at least very, very heartwarming. In a way, it's a tragedy. And in a way, it's it's ultimately just just a journey for the character, mm -hmm. and it's it's certainly a a sad experience for this character, and he, he goes through a lot. The movie makes a very strong stance about the idea that being deaf is not a life-ending disability, and it gets that message across very well. And I want to learn sign language. That should just be in the curriculum. It's it should just be a thing that everyone learns. Yeah. Um. It's a good job sounding metal. Instead of ancient Greek like we learned at our school. Yeah. Um. Give me five. Top five, baby! Three, two, one. Another Wolf round. Is... Tell me about another round. Uh, another round follows a group of high school teachers who are all friends and they decide to try day drinking and see how it affects their ability to function socially. And 
it's one of those movies where if you if you stopped it an hour in, you'd get a whole different experience out of it mm -hmm. because it works for a while. It's a very it's a nuanced look at alcoholism that doesn't really make a strong statement either it's, way. It's not really criticizing um, or making like yeah, like a strong statement. The idea they have is essentially just that you you only keep your blood alcohol to a certain mm -hmm. level, and that will improve your social life and your work life to an extent. And you never drink during the night. You never drink on the weekends. Yeah, they've only... got they've got set rules. Yeah, when they follow those rules, things work a treat. But of course, with alcoholism, it's an escalating effect, and it depicts that in a very, very creative and very clever way. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed it. Mads Mikkelsen can do absolutely no wrong. I only accept Marvel and I... Star Wars and Hannibal. Um, and I just want to make a bold statement right now. Hannibal is not good. You need to get a new personality. My only issue that I took with the movie was, and I know you, you disagree with this wholeheartedly, I thought the ending was a little weak. I just thought that it took a secondary character and treated them sort of like a victim of circumstance, when in reality they, they actually made some rather horrible decisions, and I don't really agree with the thesis statement at the end of the movie. I agree with the thesis statement of the movie as a whole, which is, you know, with regarding alcoholism and the way it affects people, but the ending was just... So Wolf Walkers. I think the first thing I said after we finished watching it was that that was like the most stunning animation I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've thought about it some more. And it, yeah, it is. It's crazy the amount of creative, bold things that they do, but it really pays off. One of the best things about the movie is how well it like delves into these different cultures, really explores them, and it's great representation. I felt very represented as a as a, as as a, a person of Irish, person of Irish myself, as a POI. Yeah, and it's just a very effective thing that isn't really explored on screen a lot let alone in, you know, animation. Yeah. And it leads to a very creative, very beautiful animated film that a lot of people slept on. I, I hadn't heard of it until I saw it nominated at the Oscars. And when I saw some clips of it while watching the Oscars, I thought, oh, I've got to watch that. Mm -hmm. That looks amazing. Yep. Like, is that the whole movie or is that just that, like, a few sequences? No, it's the whole movie. It looks, it's an amazing looking movie. Yeah. Love it. Watch it! <laughs> Two, one, Horse Bad Girl. Education. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Yes, I didn't watch Horse Girl, but you say that it's better Donnie Darko. Yes. And everyone else says, no, it's not. Everyone else can get fucked. <laughs> it reminded me a bit of Donnie Darko, but I don't actually like Donnie Darko all that much, so. Um... And, and no one likes Horse Girl. No, no, there. I <laughs> likes Horse Girl. <laughs> He's gonna dox him? <laughs> yes, he does. Oh, so I, actually, I, better yet, Beardum likes Horse Girl. <laughs> that can stay. <laughs> Shout out to Beardum. <laughs> oh, he's gonna hate that. It's weird and surreal, and I don't know why it got slept on by so many people. I don't know why it got overall quite mixed reception and quite a bit of negative reception from some. There was some weird scandal about it being about it apparently ripping off another movie. Looked into that, it's just not true. Donnie Darko? No, not Donnie Darko. Another movie that came out a couple years ago that didn't really get very big. Like, I, I saw some side-by-side -side shots of the movie where it's like, look, look, see, they're the same thing. And it's like a shot of two people talking to each other. Amazing. I the proof's in the pudding, people. <laughs> but I, I love Alison Brie, and I I think this movie's gonna become a cult classic. I, okay. I'm, 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 I'm gonna make that call now. In 10 years time, we'll see how I stand. Uh, but it's very timely as well. Alison Brie plays a girl that likes horses, which I think is a very topical. Really what it depicts is the deadly combination of mental illness and conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. And it really blends reality and sort of lucid dreaming from, from the main character. And I, I thought it was a trip and I loved it. Bad education's fucking awesome, dude. <laughs> I love this movie. One thing that I really love is when movies have stories and they're based off real events, but you, you go, is that really based off a real thing that happened? And that's what this movie does. Hugh Jackman's fantastic. I think it's one of his best performances. Oh, for sure. I loved him in it. And the music really aided um, 
the tone and the setting of the film. I loved the the contrast between this 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 grand like symphony and this state high school. Yeah, you know, it, it it sounds like a weird combination, but it works really well. It represents kind of just how seriously he. It's the world to him. Almost everyone is just a garbage human, and it's really really endearing. And it's so, it is, it is, it's good. It's, a, it's an endearing movie because they care about yeah. that one thing. I really, really recommend it. Two, one, Shiver Wolf Baby. Walkers. Hey, you've already said Shiver Baby. I've already said Wolf Walkers. Yeah. What more do we need to say? Uh, the one note that I wrote down for Wolf Walkers is gorgeous animation. <laughs> yeah, it's true though. One of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen. As far as 2D animation goes, probably the most beautiful movie I've ever seen. I love stop motion. I, I've, I've got a big, big heart for that. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of stop motion movies that I would that I would put in close competition with it. But 2D animation blitzes it. It looks like it was hand painted every frame. I know it wasn't, but they definitely did do a lot of hand painting for it. There is so much effort that was put into Wolf Walkers and it shows. It's so beautiful. It's got to be one of those timeless movies because of it. It's not going to like date with age. No, absolutely not. When I first watched it, I put it right at the top of the list. Oh, yeah. And then, I still love it, but the, the plot is just not as strong as it was on the, when I watched it yeah. in retrospect. It's still a lovely, beautiful, very wholesome story about two little girls sort of getting to know each other from completely different worlds and that kind of branching a gap between two opposing cultures. And I, I love that. But it's, it's not a 10 out of 10 plot, basically. Yeah. It's 10 okay. out of 10, it's 11 out of 10 animation. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta agree. Shiver Baby, um, one of my notes is accurate Jews. Um, it's, it's tricky because you don't want them to cross into like a stereotype of themselves. Thankfully, they don't. This is one of the most tense films seen in a while. The, the thing that I compare it to is Uncut Gems. Yeah, I, I got that vibe yeah. a little bit from it as well. First five minutes, you're kind of like, oh, I don't really get what's going on. And then when you get it, the film grabs you and it doesn't let you go. And it's so, so good. It was funny. It nails that kind of awkward humor. And when it when it was funny, it helped relieve from how tense it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, great movie. I wish that it was released wider so more people could see it. Do you think, I just sort of realized this now. Go. Is that the, the Jewish parents in Shiva Baby is for Jews what Martin Scorsese's mother in Goodfellas is and, and everything else is for Italians? <laughs> Our Jewish audience, comment below and let us know. <laughs> I don't think we're informed enough to actually say if it's completely accurate, but... We're not even informed enough to say that Mar Marty's mother is that, because we don't know. No, yeah, but Ralph the Movie Maker said that and he's Italian, so... True. Shout out to Ralph the Movie Maker, he needs more subs. We can get... <laughs> we can do that for him. Three. Two. One. Another Bad round. Education. Yeah. Yeah. I love another round. I love Bad Education. I think Another Round has one of the best endings I, I've seen in recent memory. I think it's one of the best ending sequences ever. And I think anyone that disagrees should actually, like, kill themselves. Okie dokie, you care to elaborate? No. Right, okay. Well, that education, uh, it's been said, but it's a, it's a tremendous character study, pro probably a career best performance from Hugh Jackman. I'm also really enjoying following the career of Geraldine Viswanathan because I, I'm fascinated by uh, how an Australian actress with that name has gotten so big already, and I, I hope she gets bigger because Is she she's... the student? Yeah. She yeah, the yeah student. she's great. She's one role away from just basically being in uh, like an A-list at the top. But she's in that series, Miracle Workers, with, with Daniel Radcliffe and oh. Steve Buscemi, and she's very good in that as well. She plays just a, a great character in, in the movie. The, the, the one sort of shining beacon of, of wholesomeness in the movie, who is, is then introduced to how awful all of her superiors are. And Hugh Jackman's character, as, as said, is just a character who cares about one thing and money. Um, <laughs> Two things. He, he, he's essentially, he's a white-collar Scarface. Which is a, just, 
It's a novel concept. Good way to put it, actually. Thank you. I was very proud of myself when I thought of that. Okay. Now you've ruined it. Do you have anything more to say about another round beyond your uh, your, your attempt to encourage my suicide? <laughs> <laughs> I think I agree with everything you said except the ending. Um, but that's fine. We can just disagree on that. I love the four leads. I thought they were all really endearing. Um, and they had great chemistry. It's so weird watching this movie with this concept because you kind of know that it's gonna go poorly at some stage, but you, you you almost root for them and want it to I don't know want it to work out. And uh, Matt yes. Nicholson, one of his best performances. I think him and Tom Vinterberg they should honestly just work together exclusively forever, forever and ever. We touched on this earlier as well, but I loved how. It treated drinking quite third dimensionally. It almost implied that if they hadn't fucked up in their, in their system, everything would have worked out fine. Mm -hmm. But then it introduces the human fallibility element where obviously it's going to fuck up the system because they're people. They're going to see that alcohol is working and they're going to want to do more. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, there is a part in the movie where they also up the intake. That's what I mean. That's yeah. what I, they decide that, 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 well, it's working like this. We may as well. Yeah. And, I don't know. Maybe it can be rep replicated in real life where you don't do that. Probably not. But it's worth a shot, no. <laughs> worth a shot. <laughs> Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. It's been one. You, you start the countdown. Okay, alright, alright. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 6, 3, seven, 2, eight, 1. one. The Feels Father. good, man. Just incredibly different movies. Very, very as different. As number ones. I'm glad that you didn't exclude documentaries. Because yeah. there, there was a brief discussion about, I don't know if documentaries should be included. And I, and, and I was just thinking, oh, that's my number one. <laughs> that was my favorite movie I saw of 2020. I didn't know you loved it that much. Yeah, no, I did. Because I, I, I really enjoyed it, don't get me wrong. Not a five star for me. Fair enough, but it wasn't five stars from me either. Oh, was it four, four and a half? half. Four oh, half. you didn't have a single five I star? I didn't have a single five star. Oh, dude. damn. Got close. The best documentary I've seen. And, and I will say that I think a lot of that is because I was so fascinated by the subject. And it was interesting seeing something that I already had prior knowledge about really be discussed and, and gone into in, in full detail. It's actually scary yeah. what people are like and what people can do to your creation. Because Peppy was created as a very wholesome character and was turned into a sign of hate, was stolen from the creator who desperately was trying and is still trying to get it back. And one of the best things about it is the way that it mixes its like real footage between interviews with people that were involved and, and these stories being told and like maybe news uh, articles and everything. Yeah and the way it mixes its animation. Yeah, it's gorgeous animation. It's so good. I knew as soon as it like, because it has this intro and it's talking about its creation that he clearly has a deep love for it. And then it's like the button and then going into that whole intro, yeah. I just knew that this is going to be a really endearing documentary. Yeah, when do you think people misunderstand Pepe? It really sets everything up perfectly. Absolutely. but. I still like that it's hopeful. It is really nice to see someone who just really cares and wants to, you know, set out to make people kind of just laugh. Yeah. Kind of make people happy. It, it almost works in the end, but entirely out of his control again. Mm -hmm. He still has no control over anything. Yep. While I was watching the documentary, I hadn't stopped to consider the additional use it got more recently with the Hong Kong protests. Mm -hmm. When that happened, I thought, oh, that's amazing. Yep. But again, he didn't do that. It's just a man fighting for control of his of his work. But he keeps his chin up through all of it. I got got mad respect for uh, Matt Fury. Yeah. And uh, the documentary is just fantastic. So that's my number one. First time a documentary has ever been my favorite movie of the year. So you said you had no five star uh, ratings for yes this, this, for last year, twenty twenty. Yes. I had one. It was the father. That meant, that's why it's your number one. Yeah, wow. but genuinely, it, it's it's not just that it's at number one. It is a ten out of ten movie for me. It's a it's a masterful depiction of the tragedy that is dementia. I have you know second hand experience watching someone experience it, and it's 
a very, very real depiction of it. I wouldn't recommend it to everyone. If I recommended it to someone who had, you know, a very close relation to someone with dementia, it would probably be too much for them. That's how, that's how real the depiction is. Um, at the cinema I used to work at, I had a bunch of senior citizens coming out saying that they hated it, that it was awful and really sad and scary. Yeah. And it's like, and it, yeah, is. It, it, it absolutely is. I can't blame them for not liking it. Yeah. Probably a career best performance from Anthony Hopkins, which is incredible to say after such a long and impressive career. It's just a testament to how great he is. Because he plays it so realistically. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love the nuance of when he recalls something, but you can tell that he doesn't actually quite recall it. He's just pretending. He knows he's supposed to remember you know, that. Yeah, he exactly. Doesn't remember it. That's all too real. That's mm -hmm. all, all too real. And it's great in placing you in his mind as well. Because because by the end of it, you still can't really piece everything together. You can sort of, you know, surmise, okay, Olivia Coleman's definitely his, his daughter. That other woman was just his imagination and him conflating two things he'd seen. And, and, and Rufus Sewall is, is definitely Paul and Martin Gaddis isn't. But isn't Paul supposed to be, didn't she move to Paris to meet Paul? So why was Paul living with them? Yeah. And that's never explained. And I yeah. love that, I because because that's that's clearly that's, intentional. That's not a flaw in the screenplay. It's the best thing that it does is that it makes you confused, just like um, Anthony is. To have that perspective through this character's eyes is is ridiculously bold. Yeah, absolutely. And it pays off. I hated it, mm. but I loved it. Yeah, it was it was a, a chore to get through, but in the best way possible. Yeah. And Florian Zeller, I, I hope I can see the play at some point in my life because because he adapted his own play into the uh, into the screenplay mm -hmm. and and it's like you said it doesn't hinder it that it was a play to begin with yeah it, it, it takes full advantage of the fact that it's a movie and the way it depicts everything but i'd love to see how it's done on stage it's one of the best screenplays i've ever seen depicted and i'd love to see it in stage form yep <laughs> Well, Liam Hartley, of <laughs> Australia. Yes? We've finished our top ten, shouldn't we just head on home? I mean, we could, or we could do honourable mentions. Oh, yeah. And as you know, on this channel, we don't just do any regular run-of-the-mill <laughs> honourable mentions. No, 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 no. No, you idiot. Of course we don't. We're not just gonna do like, oh, the five movies that we thought yeah. should go on the list, oh, but we didn't his, have enough his... time because there were only 10. These are special honorable mentions. And what's the first one? The first one is the Not A Movie Award. This is an award for a movie that isn't a movie. Mm. Oh yeah, it feels like a movie. It's cinematic, it's gorgeous, I love it. But it's not a movie, it's a web series or it's a mini series or it's a video game even. Could be any number of things. Three, two, one. The Queen's ass. Gambit. Some of you may be confused because the first thing from Small Axe is in my top ten. But this isn't a movie. This is the Not A Movie Award. Well, my dear friend, this is technically a miniseries. Wait, hang on. This was in your, your list as well. Yeah. No, oh. no, no. Mangrove. Mangrove. Mangrove is the first of Small Axe. Oh, okay, so it's... Wait. So it's, each is an individual story. It's, right. They're all different, and they are all movies. They were just made and, and released together as a miniseries. Oh, I see. So it's confusing. Oh, very clever. Not very a movie. clever, you fucking dirty Not a movie. Dog, you. Movies. <laughs> no, the Small Axe series is incredible, though. Um, Mangrove is the best one. It's the first one and the best one. Each one is interesting in its own right and well worth watching. And I think that it's important to watch it. So, you should. Well, The Queen's Gambit, I mean... That's the one where they play Hungry Hungry Hippos, right? Anya Taylor-Joy plays a character, uh, Beth Harmon. She's a world-renowned chess master. Mm -hmm. I thought it was based on a true story. I don't think it is, though. It isn't. It is. I'm pretty confident it isn't now. It's a person who's very good at chess and addicted. Everyone knows what The Queen's Gambit is. I'm not gonna bother explaining it anymore. It's a very good series. It's a it's a very strong character study. It's visually amazing. I think it peters off a bit towards the end, 
Well, around the middle, actually, and it, it, it has a pretty strong finish, but it is a movie. It's just a very long one. I think they wanted to make it a movie originally, but it was too hard to secure funding for a movie. So then Netflix came along with their plus, big bags of money. Plus, with a miniseries, you, you can just, you know, explore it more. Some of the best parts of the series are things that I know would have been cut if it was a movie. Like, there's a, the first episode focuses almost entirely on her childhood. And I don't think they could have done that. It, it would, would have been, been like, been it would have been like an opening scene, maybe. Yeah. That was like less than five minutes. That's when it establishes her addiction issues because she's in an orphanage in the 50s where they give people pills to make them go to sleep. Yeah. And that's that's what gets her hooked on first painkillers and things like that, and then on all manner of drugs and alcohol, mostly alcohol towards yeah. the uh, middle of the series and everything. There are some elements that are a bit eh. There's one or two episodes that I think are weaker than the rest, but. It's overall a very consistent series and feels just like a long movie. And I, I like Anya Taylor-Joy. I'm really glad uh, to see her in more stuff. And this this is basically the thing that's catapulted her to stardom. So very glad for that. You know, if New Mutants was the only thing she did this year, that'd be a little depressing. Okay. I've seen that. Also, Harry Melling, Dudley Dursley, looking fresh. Oh, good guy. Yeah. The next award the for next honorable award. mentions is the Exceeds Expectations, Expectations award. award. This is similar to the surprisingly good award from last year, except that you didn't have to think it was going to be bad yeah. for this one. You could have thought it was going to be good, and it was better. Mm -hmm. Any number of things. It just had to exceed what your initial. Yeah, it's very were much like. in the title. Three, two, one. The Bill and Ted Man. Face the Music. You said we weren't going to talk about Bill and Ted. I did. It you was lie! Misdirection. Foi. Don't worry, honey, I wasn't cheating on you. It was a simple misdirect. Like, I, I, I didn't lie when I said I wasn't. <laughs> Bill and Ted was awesome. Yeah, I loved but it. I will say that I got pretty much what I thought I was going to get. That's so good. For me, it didn't exceed any of my expectations, but I thought it was just as good as I was thinking it would be. I think it was absolutely as great as it could possibly be, because I thought like I thought with Borat. Oh, comedy movie coming out way, way later. Eh. Mm. Yeah. I thought it would be okay because Alex Winter and, uh, has been so devoted to this series and it was the same two writers. I thought there'd be something to get out of it, but I loved it. Yep. It was at the tail end of my top 10 list for a very long time. It was only pushed out like right towards the end. Mm. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Had a lot of fun. Very wholesome. Very true to the series. It's a great trilogy. I yeah. think for me, uh, the first one's an eight, and then two and three are sevens. And that's it's like, exactly the same. <laughs> it's like that's that's better than The Godfather in terms of consistency <laughs> between movies. Yeah. It shouldn't be as good as it is, but it is. Yeah, and that's great. With The Invisible Man, there's always the fear that a movie like that is going to be. Oh, it's just gonna be pretty bad, isn't it? It's just a remake. And especially coming off like the tail end of the uh, originally planned like Monsters universe that failed miserably mm -hmm. with its first release. Because they were going to do an Invisible Man movie. They were gonna have like Johnny Depp or something. Yeah. You know, the Invisible Man. Yeah. This is completely retooled, I assume, from that original idea. Yeah, it's completely different. I love how it's modernized itself in a really smart way. The first Invisible Man movie to come out is not scary and it really wasn't trying to be when you watch it it's actually funny and it is just like that, that typical like mad scientist does something and this is mad so mad scientist does something as well but, he's but it's a, about tech he's a secondary character as well elizabeth moss she's such a good lead mm -hmm. and it's really nice to see her doing things besides the handmaid's tale invisible man was very good i really enjoyed yeah. it as well and I don't, I don't think anyone was expecting it to be as good as it was. Mm. Even people that, you know, are a little bit more optimistic than you or I. Exactly. I think, I think they were surprised at how good it was. People were just sort of hoping for a dumb horror movie. Yeah. And kind of smart horror movie. Kind of smart horror movie. We'll take kind of smart. Yeah, yeah I'll take that. Good. good. Good movie. And now that we've won back the audience, it's time for uh, the final award, which is the Fuck You, I Liked It Award. I'm so excited for this one. <laughs> it's for a movie that you liked. And fuck anyone that says otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really strong on my convictions. Yeah. All right. Three, two, one. The Devil Pong. all the time. I really? thought people liked that movie. Some people liked Robert Pattinson. I thought people didn't like Robert Pattinson. The overall reception was 
Well, yeah, Robert Pattinson was kind of cool, and I guess Tom Holland's okay, but man, it was long. And man, I, I don't really see what the point was. Get stuffed, idiots. It's a great movie. It really enjoyed really all of the um, religious commentary. It's, it's just, I just love a movie that has the balls to just say religion is bad overall. Mm. I mean, that's probably not what it meant to say. That's what I got from it. Amazing atheist too over here. Yeah, I love how the movie has these interconnecting stories and it, to me it didn't feel like it was ever dragging. It was certainly a long movie. There were parts of it that were slow paced, but every character serves a purpose and the progression of Tom Holland's character is it roots the whole movie very well. And good job, Tom Holland. I I, I like you, dude. I I, I do. You know. Um, I think. I'm glad he. It led to more serious roles for Tom Holland, like Cherry. Like Cherry. And so that he's not just associated with the MCU. And I don't want to tell lies, but I thought, man, I really like to fuck this girl. Maybe don't work with the Russo brothers again. Harry Melling's in this as well. He's very good. He is. He's only in it for a little bit, but he stands out. The whole cast is great, and, you know, Robert Pattinson, I'm pretty sure we're both big fans. Just a good movie. Um, what else is a good movie? The Prom. Okay? Yeah. Okay, hear me out here. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a faithful um, adaptation of the Broadway musical, and you're basically just watching a movie of it, and it's really good, okay? And fuck you, I like it. It's a little annoying because I hate that we're trying to push Meryl Streep as a musical theater icon. She's, we aren't. She's not. Sorry, I mean we as a society. <laughs> she's iconic in her own right, she doesn't have to. She's a very good actress. Yeah, and, and an a, okay singer. She can carry a tune, but yeah, would have preferred someone else in Into the Woods. Mamma Mia's fine, I don't care about the integrity Mama, of that. Who cares, who gives <laughs> no. a shit. James Corden, he does get a lot of flack for playing a stereotype, but I can't entirely blame him, uh, because that's just how the role was played in the first place. Now that, that is something that people don't, you know, look into, is that that's just how the character is written as well. Maybe, I don't know. I, I'm, you can't I'm say not, anything because you haven't seen this the, movie. Yeah, I might watch it's it one day. It's got great music. I'm not looking great forward to the idea of James Corden being in it. I don't like James Corden either, but I don't mind him in this movie, and I think that that's really impressive. <laughs> wow. The only time I've liked James Corden is when he was playing a complete dickhead that he wrote for himself mm -hmm. in the Gavin and Stacey. America just seems to like occasionally plucking celebrities that were only mildly popular in England and then just making them big hits. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of people that hate the prom haven't seen it. So if you're going to form an opinion, maybe you should watch it first. Otherwise go fuck yourself. Can't think of who you're talking to. That's it guys and well, gals. Thank you for joining us once again. Um, I know it's June. Shut up. 2020 was a year that, uh, uh, was faced with many trials and tribulations. Like what? Um. <laughs> cut, cut back <laughs> to the clip from last year where I said we cured coronavirus. 2019. What a year. We eradicated the Donald coronavirus. Trump was re-elected. That aged really poorly. <laughs> really poorly. Really quickly as well. <laughs> 2020 was not a very good year for cinema, but we still got... Some we got righteous some gems. Things. And 2021 just needs to be the best, you know, year for film ever then. Yeah, it needs to save cinema, no pressure. Mm -hmm. um, Christopher Nolan couldn't do it, but I'm sure you can do it. James Bond movie. Uh, and Fast and Furious 9. Counting on you, Rock. Point is, 2021, we're counting on you, even though we're halfway into you already. We're counting on you to, to save the film industry. But 2020, you know, you gave us The Father and Wolf Walkers and Feels Good Man, so we're satisfied mm -hmm. for now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, number ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four.